It's good to see everybody here together today in person. It's great to see you virtually as well and look forward to what God has for us today as we continue to go from here to the cross, from creation to the cross, as you saw with the intro. And we're headed to Easter. We're headed to the cross. We're headed to the resurrection. And what we've done so far in our kind of first two weeks and leading up to this is we've, we've recognized the need in Genesis 3 in the garden we're told where mankind's, my sin and your sin, begins. A sin that permeates all of life until revelation, until the end. And so we start there. And then from there, last week, we saw God had a plan in dealing with this sin. That plan is a suffering servant. And it's the Lord Jesus and what he has in store for you and in store for me and bringing Christ. And so, so far, we've seen that happen. We've seen God lay that out there in that prophecy. And it's there because all along we've been on a collision course. There's a collision course with my sin, the prophecy of God, with the God man, the Lord Jesus, to save and bring victory and to move in our hearts. Now, this is what we do starting today. We move out of the reality of the sin, though that will still be there, and the prophecy of the Messiah to the flesh and blood of the Messiah. From here on out, we will be dealing with Jesus and his truth and his flesh and his blood and what he came to do and how he came to work. Now, here's what's interesting. Jesus, as we know, is very different than most that of his day and anyone in our day. See, Jesus didn't only come proclaiming the gospel, but when we look at the life of Christ, he embodied it in every way. He lived it out. He focused on it. And what he did is Jesus did more than say, this is what I think you ought to do. Jesus said, now let me show you how to put it in action. Every day, in fact, we even say that we can't really find a place where Jesus tells us to do something he did not do it as well. So today we give our attention to this reality and we give our attention to the gospel in action. We're going to look today in John chapter 8 at the reality of what it means to take the gospel and not just know it, not just understand it, not just receive it, but put it into action. What does it mean that the gospel is full of compassion? And what does it mean that the gospel embodies and demands responsibility? We see that today as we go through God's word and what's going on. Now, we find ourselves in in John chapter 8 in Jerusalem, background today. This was done by one of our men, by Chris, wonderful in preparation for our creation to the cross and event, and we wanted it today just to kind of give us that feel and that sense maybe of what Jesus was doing and talking as he he met in the temple with the, the scribes and the Pharisees and the people and ministering to them, and that's what's happening in John chapter 8. It's really kind of just another day of moving forward. Jesus is hip deep in teaching hip deep in ministry. He's with the people. He's also getting opposition. Every day is a day of battles and a day of victories, a day of, wow, you're so marvelous to how can we make you stumble? And all that is going on. And we find that here in John chapter eight today. So allow me to read. It'll be on the screen. And also I'll be reading from my copy of God's word. And hopefully you will join with me. John chapter eight, verses one through 11. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning, he came again into the temple. And all the people were coming to him. And he sat down and began to teach them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery. And having set her in the center of the court, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in adultery in the very act. Now in the law of Moses, now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. What then do you say? They were saying this, testing him, so that they might have grounds for accusing him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground. When they persisted in asking him, he straightened up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. When they heard it, they began to go out one by one, beginning with the older ones, and he was left alone and the woman. where she she was in the center of the court. Straightening up, Jesus said to her, Woman, where are they? Did no one condemn you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, I do not condemn you. I do not condemn you either. Go from now on, sin no more. See, Jesus reminded the people, and Jesus reminded 
the woman. And Jesus reminds you and me that the heart of the gospel is to experience forgiveness and then to live it out. The heart of the gospel is to be touched with the compassion of forgiveness and then live out that compassion of forgiveness. Now, we're going to pray together in a moment, but there's two things I want you to think about before we do. In reading from your word, if you were in a Bible or you're on, on an app, you probably saw a little indication that said, you know, that this is a later, later manuscript added to story. Okay, and so sometimes we look at that and we say, what does that mean? That means that when the John's gospel was put together as we understand it, John did not probably include that. But as things were developed over time, this was inserted. Now, that's why we're very careful when we see something like this because we want to make sure it's valid, that it passes the test of, of validity and truth. Well, in this case, what you're looking for, you're looking at other sources that, that use the same story, that told the truth, and it matches up with the context of the gospel. In this case, this story comes from other sources. The story fits the context of the gospel. So we preach this story of Scripture. Now, there's other stories that I tend to pull back on. So if you look at that and you have that question, that's why we're, we're looking at this. You always do the test of saying, let's, let's validate, let's see. What I love about this with Scripture is it tells us when, it, when it's bringing in something that may be not be accepted. It just doesn't rip out a page and add a new page. It says, by the way, you need to know about this. It adds more validity to the Word of God. And so we see that. So that's the first thing to look at. Second thing I want you to think about is this. Maybe today you're new to the gospel, you're new to the Bible, you're new to this story. And so you may even be looking at it initially and saying, hmm, what does that mean? Here's what I want to encourage you to do. I want you to lean in. I want you to listen. I want you to understand that God is speaking to you today through his word. And as you lean in and as you listen, allow him to speak to your heart. Don't seek to, to understand every nuance or issue. Allow God to speak to your heart and allow him to show you how much he loves you. Now, for some of us, this story is very common. We've read it many times. We know the Bible. We've read it many times. My plea to you, do not be too familiar. Don't say, oh, I know that. I know what it means. <sighs> when we're going to lunch. No, lean in. If you're here, you're here, hopefully, to have God speak into your life. Lean in. Don't be familiar. Let God speak something new of truth. Let him meet you where you are so that you can be used to glorify him and change others. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your love. And now, Father, as we walk into your word this morning, we praise you. I thank you, Father, for the honor you've given each of us, be it in person or virtually, to be in your word together today. I thank you, Father, that you've brought us here for the purpose of learning, of the purpose of worship, of the purpose of growing, of the purpose of, of being disciples, of the purpose of salvation. Father, thank you that you've brought us here today. Now, Father, as we open your word, teach us. Teach us some very somewhat basic but also very profound truths. And, Father, encounter us in our lives and let us allow that to happen. If we're new to your word, let us allow you to speak to us. Let us give you a chance. If we're familiar with your word, help us not to be hard-headed and hard-hearted and arrogant and think we know it all. Let us listen. Speak to us. So, Father, we praise you. We thank you for what you're going to do with this truth today. And we pray that you be glorified in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, so what's happening in the story? Jesus in chapter 7 is ministering. He goes out to the Mount of Olives to spend the night, gets up in the morning, and heads into the temple to, to, to talk and to gather and to teach. As he does, he encounters the Pharisees and the scribes. They're religious leaders, and their goal in life 
when Jesus is living is to discredit him, is to shut him down and shut him up. And so he encounters them and, and what they're doing and how they're ministering. They bring to him a woman caught in adultery, caught, they say, in the very act of committing the sin that was a sin then and is a sin today. She's there. They got, grab her. They bring her to Jesus and drop her in front of him. Basically say, what are you going to do? Now, what were the motives? Why would they do this? There were likely two motives they're looking at, all with the same intent. The, the bottom line intent would be to discredit Christ. One thing they made by, by, by laying her in front of them, and, and if she was to say, if he was to say, you know what, you're right. She has committed that. The law says it's, it's guilty by death. Pick up your stones. The issue with that, they, they thought, would be that those people that thought he was so compassionate would say, wait, wait. You said you're compassionate. He loses the populace. Or if he says, yes, you can execute her, it will go against the Romans because the Romans, other than the cross really and things like that, weren't huge apparently on capital punishment. So basically they're saying if you say executor, he's going to get it both ways. Then the other thing is if he says, no, don't do that, then we got him because we can discredit him because he refuses to follow the law and practice the law. So they were sitting there trying to test, trying to tempt, trying to bring that against them. What does Jesus do? One of the most interesting scriptures in, in scripture that obviously we have questions is he responds. And notice he bends down and writes in the ground. And just sit there, he's writing. And then, sorry, that was my fault. I apologize for that. I'll bend a different way this time. And they're just, um, he's writing and they're pushing. What you going to do? What you going to say? And he stands up. He says, you know what? If you're without sin, chunk away. Get her head in the bullseye. Get her chest right there. Go ahead. If, you, if you're without sin. That's all he said. Then little by little, rocks start dropping. Start hitting the ground. They start walking away. Isn't it interesting that the older leave first? See, what many of us are older realize that youthful idealism turns into older practicality. And so they walked away and just dropped them. They're gone. Jesus bends back down. He's writing as that's taking place. And then he looks up. And it's just him and her. Now, they haven't spoken yet. Just him and her. And that's when the engagement comes. And that's when we see the gospel in action and what Christ is doing in this story and these, these couple of just simple verses in these words. Look at, look at verse 10. Straightening up, Jesus said to her, Woman, where are they? Did no one condemn you? She said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said, I do not condemn you either. See, we, we, the gospel is full of compassion. That's a lesson today you can't miss. The gospel is full of compassion. We, if we're not careful, make the gospel a hammer. It's not a hammer. Does, it, does justice come? Yes. Do we have to deal with sin? Yes. Was the penalty paid? paid? Yes. But Jesus didn't die so we can use his death as a hammer. He died and rose so we can use that to bring compassion and wholeness to people through the gospel. Amen. That's the gospel. And so he says, woman, it's, this term here is a very respectful term that he uses. He's like, where'd it go? No one condemns you. No one has guilt towards you? No one's pronouncing, pronouncing a sentence on you? No. He said, well, neither do I. We see Jesus' mission in multiple places, but in John chapter 3, 17, fits so well. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Once again, is there judgment? There's judgment. But Jesus came to save, okay? Romans 8, 1. 
Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. When I embrace the cross and I embrace the Christ that died and rose for me, there's no condemnation. Okay? And so we, we see that here and we see that truth in that ministry. So let me ask you two questions. First, what rocks are being thrown at you and why? What rocks? As you're walking through your life right now, listen, there may be sin in your life. There may be some very open things that you, that you would even acknowledge. Yeah, I'm, I'm not right there. But ro what rocks are being thro thrown and why? And not even say by whom. You know, what, what's going on here? Listen, you need to deal with your sin, and we're going to talk more about that in a moment. No one has a right to throw rocks at you because the Lord, Lord Jesus doesn't throw rocks at you. So from whom do you need to step away? From whom do you need to get away from that's bringing that into your life? And will you step into compassion? Who's throwing rocks at you? Second, what rocks are you holding and why? What rocks are you holding? Why have you determined that you have the right to hold rocks to throw at somebody else? What gives you the right to do that? something that we need to consider and we need to understand. What rocks are you holding? Why do you give your attention to other people? Who are you condemning? As a follower of Christ, if I'm holding rocks and look to throw, I've got something wrong inside me. And I need to repent and I need to drop it. Because if I'm a rock thrower as a follower of Jesus, I have a problem in my heart. Now, to be honest with you, that's something that probably all of us in some way, shape, or form battle at different times. So all of us need to address that periodically. Some of us may need to address it wholly because that's our character. We need to be careful. The full, the gospel is full of the compassion of Christ. Before we leave this, I want you to think about something. Without compassion, there's no credibility to the gospel. If I say that I was saved by a God that loves me, by a Jesus that forgave me, and by, by a Lord who sits on the right hand of the throne of the Father because he, he rose, and then I do not speak into and live in compassion to others, my gospel has lost its sting. So we got to be careful. Let's not be Pharisees and scribes. Let's be like Jesus. Let's be full of compassion. Now, throughout Scripture, there's tension. There's tension between two different truths and how we walk through them. And this is a great story. Because the reality is we struggle with tension. We tend to lean one way or another. Look what Jesus said again. Go back down to 10 and 11 specifically to 11. She said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said, I do not condemn you either. Go from now on, sin no more. The gospel demands responsibility. Here's that tough tightrope and issue that, we, that, that, that draws tension is how do we embrace and understand compassion? How do we embrace and understand, my fault again, responsibility? How do we do that? Go and sin no more. Behave differently. No longer violate the law. Don't miss the mark. Notice those words. See, without responsibility, the compassion of Christ is taken for granted. Think about that. If, if I don't have to, to have God change me, then I just, I play grace all the time. All about compassion. I get away with everything. And there's no accountability. See, there may not be judging, especially between one another, but there is, being, there is accountability. We as believers are holding one another accountability. The Word of God is supposed to hold us accountable. And so we see that here. 
The heart of the gospel is more than compassion and forgiveness. I love this statement. The proper response to the mercy of past sins is purity in the future. The proper response to being forgiven is to being different, is letting God work in me and change me. See, we weren't merely saved for forgiveness. We weren't merely saved to go away from the penalty and punishment. But forgiveness is to be a gateway to a new life, to a new person, to a follower of Jesus. Notice 2 Corinthians 5, 17. First, many of us know pretty well. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. Okay, so I come to faith in Christ, I'm supposed to be on a road of new things. Now, are we going to stumble at times? Is, is sin going to be there? And we going to start, struggle with certain things? Of course we are. But I should be walking away. They should be behind. And then a verse that, uh, that Les quoted a moment ago in his testimony, Romans 12, 1 and 2, therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual act of service or worship spiritual service of worship. And the verse two, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Notice that. Notice those two, two passages. I come to faith in Christ and I'm on a road of growth and maturity honoring him with my life. Perfect? No. But I'm moving forward. I'm being different. I'm changing. God is working in me. What I fear sometimes, and all of us have to watch it, is we all want eternity to change. We don't want life change. I want eternity to change. I want to live with God one day. But I don't want him to be concerned about me until either I have a need that I need to pray about or until I walk into his presence because I want to be me. That is not the gospel. Amen. And we need to be mindful of that and see that great quote. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, you've heard me uh, tell about him before. Bonhoeffer was a German pastor in the 20th century. He um, was grew in his faith, got a great story. I've got his biography. He'd love to read it. It's about like that. You think he'll read it through the night? I uh, know. But anyway, um, but it's a great book. Love to loan it to you or get your own, but it, it's a great book. And, and telling his story. And he was vehemently against the Nazis. He stood against Hitler, did some other things. He got arrested. He got put in a concentration camp. He was murdered two weeks before Hitler died, I think. So right there at the end. In writing and dealing, he dealt big time with discipleship. And notice what he says here. Talks about cheap grace. Cheap grace is the grace we bestow on ourselves. Cheap grace is the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance. Baptism without church discipline. Communion without confession. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship, grace without the cross, grace without Jesus Christ living and incarnate. Hear that. Take that in. Cheap grace is, thank you, I got my get, get, get out of jail card, get out of jail free card, now I'll see you in about 75 years. That's cheap grace. That's ungodly grace. That's an affront to the gospel. We are called to receive the compassion of Christ as a woman caught in, in adultery and embrace that and be thankful for it. And then like her, we're to go and sin no more and we're to move forward and we're to let God impact our lives. Anything else is a serious misread of the gospel and a poor investment of our lives. We need to be careful. We need to be careful. See, grace is free, but grace costs something to live it out. See, if I'm going to live out grace, it's going to cost me something. It's going to cost me making tough decisions. It's going to cost me dealing with my sin nature. It's going to cost me 
changing my behavior. It's going to cost me changing my attitude and my perspective. It's going to cost, it's going to cost me drawing some lines in relationships. It's going to cost me. But you know what it won't cost me? It won't cost me hanging on a tree. It won't cost me getting beaten, abused. It won't cost me losing my life and all my blood being flown out and drawn out of me. It won't cost me being laid in a tomb. It won't cost me that. You know why? Because Jesus paid that price. So doesn't it make sense that if he paid that price for me, I would be willing to live for him in a way that makes a difference. Go and sin no more. Embody a life that represents the price that Jesus paid. So what are ways we do that? We, we make a commitment to growth and maturity. You know, we've been talking quite a bit since the year began on personal discipleship plan. And if you're online, you can, you can find it on our church website. Um, and, and what we've put there was what it means, some steps you and I can take to grow as disciples. Church family you can go that, that are here, you can go to the church website, but you can also, we have it out in, in the foyer as well. The purpose of that plan is something, basically it's just thoughts for you and me, and then we execute it. We say, okay, I'm going to make a commitment to, to prayer and Bible study on a consistent daily basis. I'm going to look at being involved in a, in a discipleship group. I'm going to look at being in a community group. You know, um, Chuck mentioned his group, he and Evelyn's group starts tomorrow night. Miss um, June and, and our ladies, they're going to start next Sunday morning. They're going to be back at it. We're just, things are starting to pick up slowly but surely. There are plenty of opportunities. But I do that. And then I serve. I minister. I find my place. Because when I have to serve somebody, I'll either get so fed up I'll leave or God will make me new and I'll serve more. Amen. And that's what God really wants to do. So those are things we do. We, we begin that growth. <clears throat> Excuse me. We, we begin that maturity. We let God, God work in us. We live redemptively. That means I, <clears throat> sorry for that frog, I live redemptively towards you. I'm not always looking at you and saying, how can I get you? I'm looking at ways I can bring you along and help you to, to grow and mature. And then I'm looking at me and, and living redemptively and not harassing and, 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 and telling myself I'm not worthy of God's compassion and forgiveness. Those are things I can do. Both of those things, compassion and redemption, and, and responsibility. That's the gospel in action. See, I want you to think about this. The gospel is not just about, um, the gospel is not just about changing our eternity. It's about changing our life. Okay? The gospel is not just about changing our eternity. The gospel is about changing our life. And we need to understand that today. Noah, go ahead and give me that last one. Thank you. The gospel is not just about changing our eternity. It is about changing our life. That's truth. That's what it's about. That, that's what God wants to do. If, if we preach a gospel that's merely say a prayer and get saved and you're okay, we are not preaching the gospel. I want you to hear that. If we preach a gospel that says, get saved and you're okay, we are not preaching the gospel. Because nowhere in the Bible does it say that. The Bible says, give your life to Christ, get saved, and show evidence of that in the way you live. So how do we apply this? As we apply it, I want you to think about it on what I'm going to call the micro and the macro level. The micro level is a small level. It's a personal level that you and I exist in every day. It's in my personal life and my relationships. The way that I, I live this out in that micro level between you and me is seeking to show you compassion, seeking to forgive when I need to forgive, which, by the way, we need to forgive everything, showing those things. And so I live it out in that micro level by being redemptive towards you, by allowing you to be redemptive toward me, 
I live it out by allowing God to forgive me and to use me and make him a part of my life. So at that micro level, it starts with salvation. If I've never received Christ, it starts there. Thank you, Miss Margaret. <clears throat> Okay, at the micro level, it starts with salvation. It starts with knowing Christ. Third time I'm wrong. Okay, yeah, just keeping you on your toes. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Awesome, you're sharp. Starts with salvation. I receive the compassion of Christ. I accept that no matter my circumstance in life, that Jesus will forgive me of my sins and make me whole. I ask him to be my Savior. I ask him to be my Lord. I repent of my sins and turn my life over to him. That's where it starts. And that's what I do. And I live out that way. So today, be it here in person or be it virtually, if you've been desiring that compassion, today's the day of that compassion. Simply where you are, talk to Jesus. Acknowledge him as the son of God who died on the cross for your sins. Re confess your sins, repent of them, and ask him to be your savior, your Lord, and to guide your life. And from there, I, I would love to spend time with you, Pastor Josh, others. We'd love to get you going. But you got to start there. That's that micro level. Micro individually is me deciding I'm going to be different. Because here's a question that I want to ask you. Do you as an individual want to be known as a person that, like Jesus says, I do not condemn you, go and sin no more? Or do you want to be known as a rock thrower? That's your choice. I really hope you don't want to be known as a rock thrower. Now, that takes us to the macro level. This is the big level. I want to talk specifically about the church and how it applies. Churches are known for many things. Churches decide what they want to be known for. Our church is and will be known for compassion. We will not be, we are not rock throwers. Now, that doesn't mean we don't struggle sometimes. There's a fine line between holding one another accountable but we're supposed to. So there's a hard line there. But compassion is, we will lean into compassion. That's why I had a conversation with our deacons and some of our leaders the other day about what are some steps we can do to be more overtly compassionate in our ministry. What can we do more and more to be more overtly compassionate within the church and outside the building as well? Because that's what not only we should be known for, our world needs compassion. Our world does not need rock throwers. People are drawn to compassion. People are repelled by rock throwers. We will not be rock throwers. And if you think you need to be a rock thrower, you need to decide if this is where you belong. I'm going to be very blunt. Because that's not the way of the gospel. Jesus stepped into Jerusalem, just having another day. And as he stepped into that day, it all broke loose. But he did what he always does. He showed compassion. He issued responsibility. And then he continued to minister. Today, we've been called to be like Jesus. Fellow believer, will you be like Jesus? Will you make a decision? And it may cause you or me, me, and I, by the way, if I'm talking to you, I'm looking at me, to deal with sin, to repent, to correct some issues and perspectives, and then allow God to breathe that life from you into others. Church family, will we make sure we're working together 
to be about compassion. And then today, if you have yet to give your life to Christ, please let this be your day. Do it right where you are. We would love to help you and walk with you. I'm going to ask our worship team, Beth, to come forward, and they're going to prepare. And as they're preparing, still keep our focus. It's been laid out before us. Very directly, God's word has been laid out before us today. Once again, my challenge to you and me is, do we want to impact our families, our friends, our communities, our city, and our world with the gospel? This is how we do it. Let's do it. Let me pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your kindness. And Lord, may we, starting with me, heed this truth today. Father, may we choose to live compassionately. May we choose to live responsibly. And may, may we make a difference for you. And God, if today is a day of salvation, may we make that decision. And once again, if you're in the building or you're, on, you're virtual, I'd love to talk to you. Shoot me an email. Send me a note. God, us now, Father, in Christ's name. Amen.